very interesting question that has caused a lot of controversy over the years as we think through what it would take in terms of physics to carry this off. Now, I have to say right from the start, it's not as if we should think there's anything that God cannot do. But we still have to ask carefully the question of what does the account claim that God is doing? And so we have to approach the text with some caution. Now remember here we're at the uh, tail end of the conquest of the central uh, territories. Uh, the Gibeonites have deceived uh, the Israelites. Uh, they've made a treaty. That was in chapter 9 of Joshua. And that treaty has uh, aligned them. The rest of the Canaanites are very upset about that because not only have they lost a, a possible ally in the Gibeonites, but also uh, that has potentially put a fortified city uh, in Joshua's control uh, to control that central hill country. So they're, they're concerned about it, and they decide to take preemptive action. And so it is that the Amorites and Canaanites move on Gibeon and lay siege to the city. Joshua hears about it uh, and uh, decides that he is indeed going to honor the treaty and come to the aid of the besieged city. He decides to try to gain some surprise, so there is a forced all-night march, and um, probably 15, 17 miles, uh, they arrive there at dawn. This would be a very difficult march uh, to do in the dark, to do that much that fast. Uh, and so there they are, having arrived uh, just before dawn, uh, ready to, uh, to come to the aid of the Gibeonites. Now, here's the difficulty. Uh, the, what is it that Joshua is praying for? Um, he sees his situation. Notice that this is happening at dawn. Okay, how do we know that? We know that because, well, let's take a look at the verses, and you'll see it. I'm in chapter 10 of Joshua, verse 12. And Joshua's prayer is, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Joshua, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. It goes on to say that there has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Now notice that it says that the sun is over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. That means the sun is in the east and the moon is in the west. This poses a bit of a problem for people who believe that he's been fighting all day and they're exhausted and they're afraid dark will come and they won't be able to kind of finish the battle successfully, so they ask for an extension of daylight. That's a problem if he's praying it in the morning. But the sun is over Gibeon and the moon over the Valley of Ajalon. Now, if we look at this as a prayer in the morning, we have to ask the question, then what's he doing? Why is he praying this before the battle even starts? Now, I should say, you might look at the text and say the battle already started because it talks about the hailstorm in the verses before this. Okay, there are three different accounts of the battle in this chapter. And after each one, uh, there's a new start. So the hailstone, hailstones was part one. Then it goes back and starts again. And the sun and moon is part two. Then it goes back and starts again. And then the chasing of the five Amorite kings starting in verse 16 is part three. Three accounts of the same battle. Okay, so with the sun and moon, we're starting at the beginning of the battle. It's morning. It hasn't started yet. What's Joshua asking for? To understand that, we have to think in terms of the ancient world. We're not talking physics here. Remember, they don't know anything about the movements of the heavenly bodies and the way they take place. They think that the sun moves across the sky. That's why he talks about the sun stopping. Some people say, I want to read this literally. If you're going to read it literally, you have to think that the sun moves because that's the language it uses. But we're in ancient world here, and they're expressing it in terms that they understand. So. When Josh was talking about the sun and moon stopping or standing still, what's he getting at? In the ancient world, 
Um, there, there is a widespread practice of celestial divination. Celestial divination observes the movements of the planets and the stars and draws information from them. They believed that the deities were communicating through this movement of the stars and that the deities used this movement of the stars. That's common in the ancient world. In that literature, the literature that we have of celestial divination, they often talk about planets or stars or constellations stopping or standing. And that talks about how it looks to them from their vantage point of observation. Joshua is using the common language of divination. Now, for this to be understood in the terms of sun and moon in the context here, we have to understand that in the ancient world they had lunar months. That is, they went totally by the phases of the moon. New moon was the beginning of the month goes through full moon in the middle of the month, and then uh, when the moon disappears, that gets to the end of the month, and when the new moon appears, that's the beginning of the next month. In that sense, they never knew how long a month would be. Eh, they knew it was 29, 30, 31 days, but you know, it really depended month to month. They liked 30. 30 days, everything was good. That was a good omen, and we have the omens that describe how, how good that was or how bad it was if something else happened. To have the month be 30 days, that would mean that the full moon would be on the 14th. They could tell the first day of the full moon because just as the sun was fully visible above the eastern horizon, the moon was still fully visible above the western horizon. That would last about four minutes. That would be the first day of full moon. They were very anxious to observe that because sometimes if it was not on the correct day, like the 15th or the 13th, they would say, this means our armies are going to be devastated. This means our cities are going to fall. Very serious things. So especially in a battle context, they would look very carefully. Um, this is that midpoint of the month. We know that because the sun is in the east and the moon is in the west. The text tells us that. And so the diviners of the Canaanites will be out at dawn watching to see if they receive a favorable omen. I would suggest to you that Joshua knows precisely what they're going to be doing. Joshua doesn't necessarily believe the omens himself. I don't think that he does, but he, he knows his enemy. And he knows that they will be totally demoralized if they receive a negative omen. So that's what he prays. He prays for the stopping and standing of the sun and moon because that would give his enemies a negative omen for the day. They would observe that and say, boy, I hope we don't have to fight today, or maybe we shouldn't even fight today. It looks like a bad day, which would be just the point where Joshua and his armies, hiding in ambush, would come streaming over the hills in the, in the unsuspected attack. In this sense, Joshua is asking God to do something that his enemy will perceive as a negative sign, because that will give Joshua an advantage. Now, it says that that's exactly what happened. The sun stood still, the moon stopped. Again, this isn't physics. This is language of divination. So that sign took place, and the enemy observed it. And so the sun stopped in its part of the sky. It says it delayed going down, I would say, entering. It's, this is a word that just talks about movement from one quadrant to another. It delayed entering for about or as on a complete day, as on a propitious day. Again, these are technical issues that uh, need to be explored and that have been explored. But you might still ask, what's going on then in verse 14? There's never been a day like it before or since. After all, if this was just the um, 15th day and we have the sun and moon together, that happens several times a year. What's the issue? But notice that the biblical text doesn't say that this astronomical phenomena never happened any other time. It says there's never been a day like it before or after, a day when the Lord listened to a man. And so the Lord fought for Israel. What's different is not the celestial phenomenon. What's different is that God allowed Joshua to suggest a divine strategy. 
After all, when the walls of Jericho came down, it was God who said, okay, march around seven times, then the walls will come down, I'll take care of that. A divine strategy comes from God. For Joshua to say, I've got a cool divine strategy, here's what it is. I want you to do, you know, have this phenomenon occur. Well, that's what was unique, that someone should dare, presume, to suggest such a thing to God. But God did it. And so, in that way, God fought for Israel, prompted by Joshua. Now, finally, some people might say, but if that's what happened, I mean, that might have happened anyway. Yeah? But think about the prayers that you pray. When you pray for good weather, for a wedding, or something of that sort, or for a picnic, certainly any skeptic could say, oh, that would have happened anyway. But when it happens, we still say that was an answer to prayer. We can't really sort out what God might have done differently that he wouldn't have done otherwise. But we still count it as an answer to prayer. Hopefully that'll help us sort out. Remember, language of divination, not language of physics.